you for joining us on this Friday wet cold um, day. So before we kick off, um, I would like to give our members and then hand over to the Minister in HOD so that we can do some introductions. Um, and also just noting I haven't yet received or haven't received any apologies um, for today. So with that, I think we do have everyone online now. I will hand over to my members. Good afternoon, Chair. Uh, uh, Khalil Barankes, uh, member of this committee. Thank you, Chair. Good Thank afternoon, you. Chair. Andrikas van der Beesteisen, member of the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon, Minister. Member Mbulelo Isaac Sileku, member of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand over to the Minister. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon to the Honourable Members. Um, I'm here representing uh, both the Provincial Treasury and the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. And we're delighted to be able to present to the committee the fourth quarterly financial and non-financial performance for the 22-23 financial year. And of course, the first quarter of this financial year. Uh, we have prepared presentations in both respects and I'm happy to take any of your questions. Thank you very much for the invitation. Absolute pleasure. Minister, through you, is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? Minister, uh, as a Minister Chair, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is uh, Velila Dube. I am Head of Department for Economic uh, Development and Tourism, and I am accompanied by uh, the officials from the department who are present uh, with us today. Thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you, HD. Thank you. Um, so, um, Chair, just to just for clarity, are we uh, going to follow the agenda as received? So we'll start with the Treasury and then move on to DDAT? Yes, that's correct. OK, perfect. All right. So then I'll hand over to the head official of the Treasury. Uh, we do have the managed team with us, but um, Mr. Savage, I don't know if you'd like to um, uh, ask um, officials to introduce themselves or if you'll just give an overview for the committee. All right. Um, Minister, uh, perhaps we can just conclude the introductions and then I'll just touch on the house rules and then hand over straight back to you. Okie dokie. Perhaps sure, all the please. Treasury officials could just briefly turn their cameras on and we can see who's who in the engine room. Yeah. Thanks. It's David Savage, uh, um, uh, head of the Treasury, and we've got the full uh, management team of the Treasury uh, joining us. Um, you'll see a number of familiar faces here, but we'll be hearing from the um, the uh, CFO uh, and the director songs predominantly, and I think uh, Ms. Gantana and myself will handle any questions that may arise. Thank you very much. All right, just with your indulgence, I just want to quickly run through some house rules. I'm sure we're all well aware, but just um, for the purposes of making sure that we have as smooth a meeting as possible throughout the duration of today's meeting, if you could kindly keep yourselves muted and also keep your video off unless called on to speak or presenting. Um, with that, also just make sure that your environment around you is quiet, use headphones, that sort of thing, if it helps to mitigate any sound or interruption. We will also have the opportunity members to ask questions at the end of each presentation. So my proposal um, is that we allow Treasury to do their brief. Um, then we will look at um, questions or take questions from there, and then we'll move on to DDAT. With that, I'll now hand back to the Minister. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. All in order, we'll then move into the Treasury presentation. And after questions, we will then do the introductions for the full DDAT team and go into their presentation. So um, over to you, HOT. Thank you. Thanks very much, Minister Chair. Good, good afternoon to members of the committee. Um, I think it's uh, the looking at the fourth quarter results is really looking at um, where we got to at the end of the last financial year. And I think we are quite pleased as a department that uh, we've met our, our efforts right across management in terms of strengthening governance systems, 
uh, and aligning our activities has led to, uh, I, I think, some uh, very solid performance uh, in the department. And I'm happy to say that that is continuing in the first quarter and indeed into the second quarter, which we won't re be reporting on now. Uh, but I won't make further comments on this. I will hand over to the CFO and Ms. Uh, Ismail uh, on some of the non uh, the non financial performance information. Over to you, Anna Marie. Um, good afternoon, uh, members, HODs, and that's my last minister, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I will take you through um, the high level on the financial and non financial performance. And Nadia um, is now the director, so um, we'll add some information if required on the um, details of the non financial performance. You will see we have. Um, split the um, energy group into two. So the first one is um, on the right hand side. You will see the information for the fourth quarter. Um, but as we have already ended the financial year, and um, we've also included the information um, for the full financial year. So starting with overall, um, we have, um, as a provincial treasury, achieved 98% of our targets that were set for the um, fourth quarter, um, and then 98,4% uh, um, for um, spending on our budget. You will see in the fourth quarter, we, have, we had 57 targets was achieved and 58 were planned. Um, and then for the, on the expenditure side, um, this expenditure was 109,884 million um, after adjusted estimate all the cash flow projections for that period of 111.564 million. I'm going on to the left hand side, and just to give you an indication of the, um, the performance for the full year, um, we achieved 95% of our. Um, of the um, targets uh, with a 99.4% um, expenditure. Um, I know if the committee will remember that in previous financial years we had huge underspending, but as the HOD indicated, we really um, managed our expenditure from the beginning of the financial year, and we're glad to say for this financial year we've spent 99.4% of the budget. So just on, we had 63 performance indicators um, that was fully achieved. Three were partially achieved, uh, two were partially achieved, and one not achieved of the 66 planned performance indicators. So we spent 317 million out of a dusted estimate of 318, uh, 518 million. The next slide, um, just a few slides just breaks the information down into our different programs. So program one is the administration program. Um, again, on the left-hand side is for the entire year, and on the right-hand side is the fourth quarter. Um, maybe just um, highlighting um, that for the, and maybe I'll just start with the, um, the performance for the entire financial year. Um, so 90% um, of the targets for program one was, was achieved, um, so nine out of the, um, of the 10 was achieved, and one was partially achieved. Um, then um, and that's for the for the quarter and then for the financial year, that's nine fully achieved and nine targets um, 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 planned. Um, just on the quarter for the um, for the financial performance, we spent 90, uh, 61 million um, out of a budget of 62 million, so 98 percent. But in total, we spend um, for, for the for the financial for the oh, sorry, the first one is for the financial year, the second one is for the quarter. We spent nine. 15 million out of the cash flow projections of 20 million. You will see at the bottom, we just indicate that the spending items remain, um, is mainly relating to the assets, replacement of obsolete computer equipment, audit fees, consultancy fees, computer services, and fleet services, as such for the GG Finance lease. Going on the program here, the next slide, sustainable resource management. You will see for the um, for the financial year um, that was 28 um, targets was fully achieved. 
and one target not achieved, and that is 97% of the targets was achieved. And then for the um, quarter four, 24 targets fully achieved of a planned um, target of 25. Um, and you will then see that's 96% and the targets that target was not um, fully achieved, uh, um, that was not fully achieved, is a number of assessment on the service delivery agreement, um, I think IDMS protocol agreements. Um, going on to the expenditure, so for the year they spent 99.6%, that's 127 um, million, 431 million out of adjustment estimate of also 179.79 million. Um, for the quarter, spent 44 million out of uh, cash flow projections of 45 million. So the main expenditure items uh, include audit fees, consultancy services, computer services, legal services, printing and publication, and transfers to the gambling and racing board, as well as um, grants to the municipalities. Um, program three, and the program three, asset management. You will see for the um, quarter, um, 12, 92% um, um, targets achieved, the 12 targets, 100% um, achieved, 100% and above. The one was um, partially achieved, and that's a number of procurement disclosure reports. And then for the quarter, um, 13 was um, um, achieved, um, planned and 13 achieved. Going on to the financial performance um, for the year, spent 100.8%, um, spent 77,561 million out of adjusted estimate of 76,937 million. Um, for the quarter, spent 102.4%, and the spent was. Um, 26,932 million out of the cash flow projection of 26 million. And we will also see that the main expanding items included consultancy services, computer services, agency services, and um, leasing of a building, pension penalty, and transfers um, to the municipalities. Going on to program four, financial governance. Um, so for the for the annual um, targets, 14 um, achieved, 100% achieved, um, and for the quarter, there was 11 targets, and 11 targets were achieved. Spending, 98.7%, um, so spent uh, 51 million, um, 082 out of the adjustment budget of 51.773 in the last quarter, and spent 19 million, um, 0 double three million out of the cash flow projections of 19.691 million. So the main expenditure items um, resulting uh, include consultancy services, audit fees, and also transfers. So that is for the fourth quarter and annual for the 2022-23 financial year. Going on to the first quarter for the 23-24 financial year, you will see that um, the targets achieved were 34 out of the planned target of um, 35, and you will see that the program was indicated. So 100% for program one, 100% for program three, up to 100% for program three, and 83% for program four. Looking at the expenditure, you will see that the actual expenditure was 79.869 million out of the um, main budget of 34 million, 674, and cash flow projections for the quarter was um, 59 million. So we you will see that we have spent a um, little bit more than what what was planned or according to our um, cash flow projections, and that is mainly due to the increase in the cost of living um, adjustments that um, were not budgeted for, as well as the um, earlier than anticipated payment of um, the transfer to the gambling board, as well as in the transfers to the municipalities. So you will see that program one spent 21% of the uh, main budget, program two spent 27%, 
program three, 19 percent, and program four, 23 percent. So in total, we spent 23.4 percent, and in the first quarter, um, that's just an, on a high level. Then going into the detail per program. So program one achieved eight um, of the targets, and 100 percent um, achieved. And on the main budget, as indicated, we spent um, 21 percent um, out of a cash flow projection of 12.253 million. Um, then, um, as indicated, we um, that was 14 million that was spent, and the expenditure items is mostly on compensation of employees, goods and services, transfer payments, capital assets, as well as the payment for financial assets. Going on to program two, also achieved as indicated in the summary. 14 um, of its targets, 100% so um, of its targets was achieved. Um, um, uh, of the main budget, 27% was, um, was spent. Um, and the cash flow projections was 19 million. Um, and um, as indicated, we spent 37 um, million was spent. Um, and as indicated, mostly on um, COE, then um, goods and services and transfer payments, as indicated previously to the gambling board and the Western Cape um, Financial Management Capability Grant and some leave gratuity. Then going on to program three, also fully achieved all its targets. Seven targets was set and seven was achieved um, for the first quarter, looking at the um, financial performance um, at, out of the main budget um, of 89,576, 19.5% was spent. So 17.483 million um, was spent um, out of the cash flow projection of 18 million. Um, as was always indicated that um, the majority of the expenditure was for compensation of employees, goods and services, consisting mainly of computer services and consultants, and then also on transfers and subsidies, mainly as with regard to the financial management capability grants and the leave group in the Sorry. Um, then on the... Um, uh, program four, financial governance. Um, five targets out of the six targets um, were achieved. Um, and we'll also see that some of the targets um, were over, overachieved. Um, and then indicating just on the <clears throat> on the main budget, uh, on, on the um, financial performance, uh, of the main budget was um, for, is 44.873 million and 23.8 million percent was spent. Um, the cash flow projections was 9.42 million and 113.3 percent of the cash flow projections was spent. So that is a total of 10.676 million. Also again, a major expenditure item on this program is um, is compensation of employees, um, goods and services, mostly on travel, and then transfer and sub subsidies, also the financial management cap um, capability grant and the leave gratuities that was paid. Um, so thank you very much. That brings me to the end of um, the presentation. Mm. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, with that, members, we will now have an opportunity to ask any questions. So should you have any questions, please use the raise hand function on Microsoft Teams and we'll take questions in rounds of three. Perhaps um, if you could limit your questions to three per person per round and we'll take it from there. Um, but before doing so, I do see a hand from John Peters. Sorry, to um, no, John, I'm Sorry. just going to... That's not the end. Sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Members, are there any questions? I recognise Member Van der Vestesen. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
thank you for the presentation. I must say it's very difficult to ask questions on percentages. I'm used to it that the uh, indicators are shared with us and that we get an indication of which indicators were achieved, which indicators were partly achieved, which indicators were fully achieved. And unfortunately, with these percentages, I find it impossible to meaningfully uh, put questions. And I would love to know uh, why the decision not to, you know, bring to us uh, the specifics of the indicators that may not be not have been been uh, achieved. Thank you, Chair. Uh, apologies, I recognize the... Member Inconsul. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to you and the members and uh, the colleagues. Um, I think I would uh, also uh, support getting some clarity from the department from what uh, Member Van der Versaison has asked, uh, because I think that helps uh, also not to actually be asking um, repetitive questions that would have at least been able to look at the information to understand things better. Uh, two things, Chair, I want to ask on my side. I think on slide five and six, I think in the percentages that are given, I just want to know um, what is the what is the percentage of this uh, consultancy uh, fees uh, that went out and what exactly uh, are those uh, for? And then I would like to understand uh, this concept of the cash flow projection uh, uh, in terms of the financial performance, um, where a particular program would have had a more than 100% cash flow projection. In simple, in simple layman's terms, what does that mean? Because that's the challenge of getting, you know, a more um, um, technical presentation that then would miss uh, people because these are committees that are not only for ourselves, but also for members of the public. So we want to make things more simplified for people to understand and read the information. So if I can get um, uh, uh, that uh, just to have a better understanding of what uh, that uh, concept of cash flow projection, which is more than 100% uh, uh, means versus the financial performance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member and Control. Um, members, are there any further questions? Uh, Member and Control, I see your hand is still up. I don't know if you had an additional question. Okay, nope. All right, I see no further hands. I'll also put some questions forward. Uh, my first question is, what contributed to the improved expenditure that we saw on slide three compared to the previous financial year? And then, on slide four, um, there was mention of one of the targets being partially achieved, and the note was that it related to equipment that was still ongoing or needed to be replaced, so we could get more information there. And then slide five, um, there was an item that was not achieved, and the note was that it was related to the assessment of SDAs, if we could get more information on why that was not achieved. With that, I will hand back over to the department. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair, and to the members, maybe I'll just start. Um, where we, when we received the invitation, uh, we were simply asked to present our financial and non-financial performance. There was no format provided. If the committee would like a specific uh, way in which uh, they'd like the information presented, we're very happy to do that. Um, but then we just ask if that could be communicated to the um, to, to ourselves, uh, and then we'll present it in that way. Uh, if you if you'd like it actually extracted from the APPs, then we'd be very happy to 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 provide that. Um, then uh, for the more technical questions, HOT, can I hand over to you uh, regarding the consultancy fees, the cash cash flow projections, improved expenditure, and then. Um, the um, partially met targets on equipment and SDAs. Thank you, Minister. Yes, absolutely. We're very happy to share the information in the APP uh, again with the committee. Um, we just provided a summary form of what was partially or not achieved in this presentation. Uh, that was, uh, as the CFO had indicated, 
two targets that were partially achieved and one that was not achieved. The two that were partially achieved at, uh, were associated with the publication date target of the procurement, one of the quarterly procurement disclosure reports. And the reason that we missed that date target by a few days was that we but we hadn't completed our review processes. It's quite a complicated report to put together. We integrate a range of data sets and as members will be seeing it, it evolves every quarter. Uh, and so so um, we were we were just delayed, and we were do, in doing all of our quality assurance processes and allowing them to conclude before we before we publish. Um, the, because as members will also know, that is not audited information; it's in-year information that we publish. So it does require extra level of of of, of checking every every year. There was some under the other partial achievement was on bursaries. This is an ongoing challenge that we have, where not everyone takes up bursaries that we offer to them, and so that we do miss the target there sometimes. And then the target that was not achieved relates to uh, a bigger infrastructure reform that's underway in the province which is enabling um, the departments of health and education to use multiple implementing agents for their infrastructure projects. In order to do so, they need to put in place uh, service delivery agreements, and those agreements they have to negotiate with their implementing agents. We uh, were targeting to review the, the service delivery agreements to provide an assessment, a third party assessment on those agreements, but we did not get the agreement finalized in time in order to be able to do the full assessment. We did an assessment on a, a partial part of an agreement, uh, just as a matter of course, as participating in the process, but it wasn't the final agreement. And so we can't claim uh, that we hit that target uh, or that we actually partially achieved it in in, uh, in that case. Although, you know, the processes are underway, it's just uh, the, measurement, uh, the measurement issue there. Um, the uh, so I hope that answers uh, Honourable Van der Westhuizen and Honourable Nkondla's concerns. We can certainly, as the minister says, annex the the uh, the, uh, the APP uh, indicators to, uh, and targets to future uh, future submissions to the committee if that would be uh, helpful. Um, I think uh, Member Nkondla asked on the cash flow uh, projection. Uh, how does that work? Um, we so we, we're given an appropriation every year on the budget for the department. It's broken down by program, and then we work out in the course of every month and every quarter, in particular, what we're planning to spend towards meeting that uh, the to, towards filling out that budget. Uh, the actual cash that we're going to spend in each quarter. That's part of our planning exercise. It's one of the parts of our financial planning exercise in here. So what we're reporting to you there is, are we running ahead or behind of our planned spending schedule for the year? The, 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 as the CFO uh, showed, in some of those cases, we are running ahead. In other words, we have expenditures over 100%. Now that is largely being driven by two factors uh, in the in the department. The one factor is the um, uh, uh, the effects of the wage agreement, the improvement in conditions of service. That's a systemic factor, and it's going to happen throughout the year. We don't yet have the money as a department to pay the full costs of that agreement. That is still something that is being discussed at national level uh, as to where that funding will come from. But it is not in the budget for the year. But the salaries have been the salary increases have been centrally implemented. So across all departments, you'll see that uh, uh, in the in the province and in fact in the country. That, uh, that that money is going out faster than it was planned to go out for compensation uh, because of that, uh, that, that effect. And that's a big driver uh, in, what, in what you're seeing in the provincial treasury vote. Uh, there is another driver, which was we were able to get one of the grants out to municipalities a little earlier than we had anticipated. Uh, and we were keen to get it out early because we want to make sure that it is arriving in synchronicity with the municipal financial year. Uh, and so the uh, that was that was our big driver uh, there that led to some advance on the on, on the uh, on, on the expenditures relative to our projections. I think those were the two major items in in that uh, in that respect. Why the improvement, Honourable Murray asked, why the improvement in expenditure 
Uh, there's been a lot of work on our systems in the department uh, at the planning level, at the execution level, and at the monitoring level. But I will say that the main reason for this improvement is just simply the 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 passion and intentionality of the management team. Uh, they've been uh, really focused, incredible in uh, putting putting in systems and practices that make sure that uh, that we spend according to our plans and that our plans maximize their impact. And so I think the credit really is due to them in that uh, in that respect. Um, on the question of the consultant costs, I will hand over to the CFO for the data in that respect. Um, good afternoon, yes, thank you for the question. Um, I will uh, respond, um, maybe just in a high level. Um, all of the detail um, of the uh, consultancy expenditure is available, and it will be also presented in our annual report, um, in, in part D of the, of the, of the auditory of the annual report, um, but I will just go through it very high level on program three, and that was on slide five, and then program, um, program two on slide five, and program three on slide um, six. So for program two, it was on the expenditure reviews, 324,000. It was on the 12th, 20th and 21st amendment bill, oh, 1 million. It was on the research and review of the gambling policy of the Western Cape, 456,000. It was probability investigations for the nominations of the appointment for the Western Cape Gambling Board members, 144,000. It was the Fiscal Futures Project, 1,117,000. It was on the PERO, 772,000. It was on the uh, mirror, 1.2 million. Then it was on the municipal revenue masterclass, 278,000. It was on the municipal interventions at Beaufort West uh, municipality, 1.2 million. So that is with regard to program two. Consultancy um, services for program three is SEM reform. 1.99 million, and the asset management um, capacity building project through um, training and development, 1.770 million, um, and also the an asset management um, project of 215,000. Then it was um, SEM reform and the drive value for money, 570,000. Plus another 175,000 rand for a business analyst on that same project. Then Gardener subscription, 3.5 million. Partial support, 132 million. And the DEMIS project, about 1, 1 million. Um, and then on the Oracle, 1.8 million um, business analyst. Um, that was 4.11 million. That is the total for um, program three um, asset management. Thank you. And sorry, just to conclude, uh, Honourable Chairperson, um, I've just confirmed we did actually submit the tables of the APP indicators in our in our submission with the presentation to, to the Committee Secretariat. So we have provided them, we just didn't go through each one of those indicators in, uh, in detail, but the Committee does have them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I note Member van der Westhuizen's hand. I just wanted to flag, as he's also raised in the comments, that um, with Ms. Smith, there seems to be an issue. Your your sound seems to be slightly distorted. Um, so perhaps there might be an issue um, with your laptop or with your connection. If you could possibly just look into that so we can hear you crystal clear. Um, and then also noted, um, Mr. Savage, or HD, that we have received um, the uh, APP. I just want to check in with our procedural officer, Zahida, um, if this has been sent to the members as well. Thank you, Chairperson. All the information was sent to members. Okay, so members, you will have that um, at your disposal. 
I will now take next round of questions and I see a hand firstly from Member van der Westhuizen and then from Member Nkondlo. Thank you, Chair. As indicated, I really struggled to follow Ms. Smith's uh, and I was also under the impression that she was continuing with the presentation, yet nothing appeared on my screen. Uh, uh, did she speak to the presentation uh, that 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 was the can I call it the second half of the file or the presentation forwarded to us? All right, we'll put that question back to Ms. Smith. Um, I don't know if you'd like to come in on that quickly, Ms. Smith. Um, good afternoon again. Can you hear me clearer now? I can, yes. Okay, sorry, I'm maybe just speaking closer to the microphone. Um, no, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. van der Westhuizen, um, I did not um, talk from a presentation. Um, I replied or responded to the question of Minister, uh, Mr. Um, Member Nukontlo on the consultancy um, expenditure, because that was the question that she asked. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Member Nkontlo. Thank you, Chair. Appreciating the response uh, from, from, from the HOT, I would like uh, to further suggest that whilst I appreciate that the information may be in the APP, I would think uh, it helps in referencing or even in the footnotes, especially this, um, just to uh, relate to the indicators achieved versus those that are not achieved, because obviously one would have to go and read, uh, I think, that report to extrapolate. And that's why I also consider, colleagues, that this engagement is not only to the members who've got the luxury of having that particular report. I would think for future, I think just to make such a, whether in a footnote becomes important, including what the uh, HOD is raising, because I think the issue of the, um, the, the, the budgeting uh, of the province national versus the municipality is always an issue when also we speak to what goes to the municipalities because I would recall recently now when we're in the energy crisis meeting because the grants, part of what the municipalities would be complaining is the grants that comes to them uh, from the province, the timing and the implication thereof, it always helps so that in an, an impression, you know, which is more of a, of a technical nature, you know, is not created through the presentation. So we know that this is just a time lag based on the differentiator between our, uh, 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 the provincial, um, um, provincial treasury timelines versus that of the municipality. I just wanted to make that chair because I think as the HOD explains, yes, it makes sense, particularly the issue of the of the grants to the municipality, which would have a, dif a different timing. I'm worried about this notion of the of the COE. Um, I'm, I'm, I must state that upfront. It is worrisome because, you know, as a totaling figure, you know, when we speak about the fact that, you know, we're still waiting for from national, if those are not concluded, they would always, as he has explained this notion of cash flow projection, they would always demonstrate that uh, there is a potential of overspending or from what we have, we're in anticipating, you know, having uh, to uh, budget for commitments that we do not necessarily have the money in our coffers. I'm not saying there must be a response about it. I'm just saying, as he had explained, um, the budget of the COE and how it relates to the fact that um, uh, the issue of um, a, a bargaining is done at a national level. I, I just wanted to sort of uh, register my, my, my concern uh, because if nothing happens, we're always going to be sitting with this uh, dilemma between uh, what has been agreed upon nationally and what then we do have in our coffers to actually uh, spend. Uh, but thanks for, for, for the explanation. Thank you, Member Nkontlo. Um, and I'll just jump on your last question um, and also pose one last question for this round. Um, to your question or your comment on COE, 
my question to the department is what sort of mitigation measures are you taking in the event that CRE becomes a bit too pricey and um, and isn't quite affordable. We don't, of course, want to be in a situation where other provincial governments or municipalities have found themselves in where they have struggled to pay. And so um, I imagine you have considered this risk um, in great detail. So uh, if you could share with us the mitigation measures that you're considering or that you may take. And then my last question is, um, I note that the the passion and drive has been a massive contributor towards um, increased or, or better monitoring of expenditure. Um, but uh, HD also alluded to systems. And if you could possibly just talk us through some of those systems. Um, before I hand back, I do see a hand from Member van der Westhuizen. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you. And with reference to your systems, one of the items that has not been part of the APP, but which I am particularly interested in because I think uh, the Western Cape uh, has got an enormous role to play there, is the, the uh, piloting of the software system for the public service in terms of particularly financial administration. Uh, my uh, impression and, and recollection is that uh, the Western Cape was chosen to pilot uh, 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 the new software, and I'm referring here to, the, you know, I used to know it as BAS and Persol and so on. Uh, and 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 I would love to get some feedback as to whether that is still being piloted, how are things going, uh, uh, are we still part of that pilot, have we walked away from from the, those, can I call it experimental software, or, or uh, have I got it completely wrong? Uh, is, is that not not being uh, expected of the Western Cape to still assist with the development of that software, which I understood eventually would be rolled out nationwide. Thank you. Thank you, Member. We'll now hand back to the department. Thank you very much. Uh, I think for uh, Honourable Encontro, we absolutely take the steer on um, on the indicators. We'll look at how we can visually represent that much in a much more useful format next time. Uh, uh, very very happy to have suggestions in that uh, in that regard. Um, the uh, on the question of the wage agreement, the improvements in conditions of service. Yes, it is a big issue. It's a very big issue right across the whole of government. Um, the And as a vote, we experience exactly that same pressure. So uh, the, the measures that we are, so the first thing we do obviously is we, uh, we closely monitor our situation with respect to COE, and that's why our cash flow versus uh, uh, our cash flow forecast versus actual expenditure data, which we presented, is so so important from a management perspective, because what you don't measure, you can't manage, and we can measure this, and we manage it very tightly. What we're doing in this respect. Um, is uh, three main things at this point uh, while we wait for greater clarity on the funding of the of the wage agreement the 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 first is we are only proceeding with filling critical posts only and we've got a uh, committee that sits in the department that requires motivations uh, set criteria for criticality uh, and that sits, uh, uh, that sits monthly uh, and sometimes as needed uh, to review uh, proposals to fill posts once they become uh, they become vacant. The, um, the, so we have that control measure in place. What we're currently doing, given our situation, is we put a pause on recruitments. Uh, the um, and uh, for, but it's a short it's a short term pause while we uh, review and strengthen the arrangements for motivations for filling critical posts. Um, and so there's a bit of a backup occurring now. Uh, we just want to make sure that we don't make mistakes in hiring now uh, the, uh, when we're not going to have the money in the long term, if we're not going to have money in the long term to cover it. So that's the work that's underway. Uh, we're hoping to have that new framework in place by the end of next week, in fact. Um, and uh, there are also other strategies that are happening alongside that, including delays in the filling of posts. 
the um, the uh, so you know these are none of these are ideal solutions, but uh, the but if there's no funding of the if there's no additional funding, there's some very very hard choices that need to be uh, that need to be made for the in the provincial treasury as a department, but right across government uh, in this respect. From uh, um, you know more of a policy perspective, this is an issue that uh, certainly the minister and I are absolutely seized with. Uh, and in regular discussions with national government, uh, I know the premier has taken it up with the president as well. So there's a lot of work that is going on into, at, the, at the policy, at the fiscal policy level uh, around around these issues. But given our focus here as the department, we are certainly taking management action as a department right now uh, to make sure that we're in the best possible position to to uh, navigate it. And those are some of the. Um, uh, some of the measures. Honourable Murray, you asked what are the sort of changes that we made to our systems? We have focused on strengthening planning, strategic planning. Are we clear on what we want to do, when we want to do it, uh, and have we focused on execution as far as possible in advance? So what's our procurement planning like? Uh, when are we planning to uh, procure? What's our financial planning like? Does that match up with the procurement uh, planning? And what? how are we managing risks around uh, all of this? So our know, managers are putting a lot of attention to that. Um, and that's just the basics of, of good governance, but good governance with uh, with 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 uh, um, strategy applied to, uh, applied to it, and it works. The, um, we review that on a quarterly basis in an integrated way where we resource managers with a lot of the management data they need on a quarterly basis to say how they're going against their plans. What are the risks that are seen by others? Where are things looking like they may run into delays uh, and so forth? And so we have those resource conversations, re review conversations on a quarterly basis that provides the information to, uh, to managers so that they can take uh, the necessary actions to keep themselves on 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 track and that's been a very useful uh very useful exercise and then thirdly we've also strengthened our control functions so the we we make sure that uh we spot uh potential risks as early as possible and, and mitigate uh and take the take the actions necessary to maneuver uh, around uh around those risks and, and and our control team's been terrific uh in that regard in in pre-identifying issues and helping us take uh, take the the, uh, the necessary steps to to deal deal with them. So it's an integrated approach. It's not rocket science. Um, it's good governance, uh, but uh, it's about integrating our systems uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that it focuses on uh, the the delivery of what we want to achieve, um, the, rather than just being compliance exercises. Uh, Honourable Van der Westhuizen, you asked on the on the IFMS, the Integrated Financial Management System. Uh, you will know that that's got a long history. The uh, the um, the uh, National Treasury is currently struggling with the IMF, IFMS uh, uh, rollout. The Western Cape is a pilot site. I'm very really happy to be a pilot site. There's not a lot of piloting going on at the moment. It is wrapped up in a, a whole series of disputes. Uh, I think there's a dispute with the Auditor General. There's an investigation with the SIU that's underway uh, and, and so forth. And that has really disrupted uh, progress on the IFMS. Um, we have been speaking to National Treasury around this because it's uh, it can no longer be delayed. We urgently need to modernize our, our transversal IT systems. We have a program to evergreen those systems. And one of the things we're focusing on, on the two things that we're focusing on at the moment. The, the first is uh, uh, data warehousing to make sure that there's, there's improved interoperability between various systems. That's a big challenge. How do you get the big systems to speak to each other? Um, the, uh, and so that's the one area we're focusing on. And the second is uh, in, in our uh, e-procurement uh, solution, uh, which is, uh, which is uh, continuing to be very, very successful. Uh, as, a, as an initiative, and it's built on a modern cloud-based uh, platform, the, uh, and we think has got some prospects to become one of the core components of the new IFMS nationally. Uh, 
Um, and so we're continuing to roll out the modules of that in a in a stepwise uh, stepwise fashion. I think we briefed the committee on that before. It's obviously a very detailed uh, program. It has a range of modules. You already see some of the some of the data that we're able to produce uh, in our and you in our quarterly uh, procurement disclosure reports uh, as as well. So you can see the sort of richness of what is possible with modern IT uh, systems, and that's you know that's just the quarterly quarterly um, reporting in that respect. The only other development in that place, which is one we're quite happy about, is that we've heard that National Treasury may review instruction note four, I think it is, the OAG may review instruction note four that limits the amount of software development that can, ha can happen. The limits the amount of systems develop, software systems development that can happen. That was to lay the pathway for um, uh, uh, the IFMS, but given that's delayed, it's really disrupting the sort of innovation that can and should be happening. Um, and so we're very happy that they're reviewing that uh, to provide us with a, just a little bit more flexibility um, the, in, in that respect. So it is a subject matter in its own right, but I hope I've, I've given justice to your, to your question on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, HD. Members, if there are no further questions, then we can excuse our Treasury colleagues and perhaps move on to the next presentation. I see no hands. Um, with that, I would, I would like to sincerely thank um, the colleagues who have attended from Treasury for your presentation today. I'll hand back to you, Minister. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and then uh, let me start by introducing the team from the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. If uh, you could all put on your cameras and uh, HID, I'll leave it to you to make the necessary introductions. Uh, the CFO has just arrived. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister and Chair and members. Uh, as Ellie indicated, my name is Veli Ledube, Head of Department Economic Development and Tourism. I'm accompanied by officials from the department. You can see all the faces on the screen. Maybe we can quickly do a round of introductions, quick introduction, who we are, what we do in the department, and then CFO will then lead the presentation, I think together with Gail. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to field any questions that members might have. If we could just do a quick introduction, please, uh, elevator introduction. Let's start with you, John, maybe in that order. OK, uh, John Peters, Program Manager for Program 2, which is Municipal Economic Support, Rate Reduction and Enterprise Development. Thank you. Lydia. I'll go next. Thank you very much. Afternoon, you Elizabeth Skolfak. I'm the Chief Director for Sector Support. So I look after tourism um, and Westgrow, as well as all the priority sectors, agro-priority manufacturing. Thank you very much. Nizam Joseph, uh, Chief Director, Skills Development and Innovation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Tim Paul. I'm Chief Director for the Digital Economy. Mamila Abrams, the Chief Financial Officer for the Department. Good afternoon, Faye Darcy, Municipal Economic Support in Program 2. Good afternoon, Herman Jonker, Coordination of Industrial Development, Program 5. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon Fernand Abrams, Acting Director, Cape Catalyst. Good afternoon, Joshua Wolbrands, Enterprise Development. Good afternoon, Michelle Ellis, Rita Production. Hi, it's, it's afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Olivia. Hello, Apologies. everyone. Can we kindly mute if we are not speaking and then allow for the person presenting to just introduce themselves? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Olivia Dias, Digital Economy, Program 5. Good afternoon, everybody. Gail Smith um, from the Monitoring and Evaluation Unit. Good afternoon. I'm Kudual Dingan, Program 3, Agri-Processing. 
Good afternoon, Jacques Stoltz, Director of Tourism Programme 6. It looks like, Chair, we've got everybody that's part of the team, and I'll hand over to the CFO to lead the presentation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, HD. Thank you, HD. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. So the purpose of today's presentation is just to provide the committee with an overview of the performance achievements as at the end of 22-23, the quarter four performance, as well as the first quarter performance achievements in terms of 23-24. So I think maybe just to provide a bit of context in terms of the department's performance, I think since 2021, the department managed to achieve 84% of the performance targets. 100% in 21-22, as at the end of the fourth quarter, 22-23, 96%, and then for the first quarter of 23-24, at 55% of the targets was achieved. With regard to the non-financial performance for as at the end of the 22-23 financial year, just to note that from a spending perspective, the department managed to spend 98.6% of the budget. Um, all programs, with the exception of economic planning and business regulation and governance, managed to almost spend the entire budget. With regard to the targets, the department managed to achieve 96%. And then again, with the exception of business regulation and governance and economic planning, which is the only two areas where we've actually not met our 100% targets. In regard to, or with regard to business regulation and governance, the main reason is that the department was not able to establish the consumer tribunal. And that is mainly due to the probity checks that was not favorable in terms of the potential candidates that we uh, wanted to appoint. With regard to economic planning, this specifically related to funding that was received late during the 22-23 financial year. And although the department did not manage to recruit participants in the last quarter of 22-23, this target was subsequently achieved within our 23-24 financial year. I think it's important for us to just do a very quick snapshot or report card in terms of what we've achieved. With regard to our entities, um, again, our entities is a significant portion of the department's budget, and it's important to, to reflect their performance uh, within our, our department. So with regard to Atlantis ECZ, we managed to land 102 million in infrastructure investment via our DTICC ECZ fund, 229 million in terms of Freeport Saldana from the same fund. And then the um, Freeport Saldana has also signed a memorandum of understanding with Cecil towards a potential green hydrogen hub investment. Most notably, I think the Westco achievement shows us that they've managed to bring in 4.1 billion of committed investment, of which 50% will be directly from foreign investors, 3.1 billion in terms of exports, 423 million secured for higher events and conferencing. And I think important to note is that this will translate into 2,413 jobs being facilitated through our uh, investment and exports. With regard to our enterprises and entrepreneurs, the department as a whole managed to support 628 businesses and entrepreneurs. Again, maybe most notably of the 54 that we've supported through our SME booster program in terms of the municipal trading spaces. The 285 specifically through our SME business support program whereby we've also managed to facilitate 651 new jobs and leverage 8.6 million. And then also, I think, to note our 218 uh, businesses that we assisted through the energy and water resilience queries. And then I think, again, uh, another area that we probably want to highlight is that we've managed to have at least 63 host employees participate in our skills programs, which has managed or which has helped the department to actually unlock an additional 201 million from these businesses towards our 
skills training programs. With regard to the access to skill opportunities, the again as a as a whole, the department managed to train 9,697 businesses. And a big percentage of that relates to our call centers BPO. And I think again we it's important to note that most of our call center agents as female, young youth people, um, call center agents, which is which we've actually managed to obtain workplace learning for them. 1,322 trained within our retail, hospitality and tourism industry. And then again, within our artisan, which is one of our skill skills areas, 355 um, artisans trained within our mechanical, fitness and, and welders areas. Another important area to note is our 4,596 um, consumers reached through our consumer education, which consists of general consumer awareness, but also very importantly, a financial literacy program. With regard to our ease of this doing business environment, we've actually managed to unlock 540.6 million rand savings to the economy via our ease of doing business unit within our department. And that is mainly achieved through our business helpline where 519 inquiries was resolved at a 91% um, resolution rate. And also at least 80% of that we've actually managed to obtain a satisfaction rate. Why that is important is that these inquiries relate to blockages within businesses. And if the department is able to assist, they're able to actually unlock major growth opportunities within these businesses and obviously translate that in terms of growth opportunities to the economy as well. The um, Healthline area has also been nominated for a Service Excellence Award. And then another important area for us is to look at our digitization and in, within this area, within the government sphere specifically, we've managed to digitize, digitize the legal license process, which will result in significant reduction of turnaround time for our legal license holders. Then still within our ease of doing business area, I think important to note within this area, specifically support we've provided to municipalities. And this is across the municipalities where we provided the municipality with digitization of 15 business facing services. And again, the reduced turnaround time, turnaround time within this area helps these municipalities and businesses within these, these municipalities to unlo unlock uh, business growth. Because obviously there's a cost to businesses if we are still sitting with heavy administrative processes within these municipal areas. Um, the other areas is just relates to our regulatory reform, and I think there's some notable achievements within this area as well. Then I think just, just a very quick report card in terms of our preliminary progress against our, our five-year goal. Um, we are or at the end of 22-23, we were at the end, we were um, at year three of the five-year goals, and I think the department is is making significant progress towards these five-year goals. But the important thing to note here is that although our services, or whilst we are delivering on our services, we're also ensuring that all our service delivery is embedded in good governance. So this is the 11th year that the department achieved a clean audit, and I think it's just something that we also wanted to note. Then with regard to quarter one, 23-24, again to note, quarter one generally is the slow quarter, it is the quarter where the department prepares the procurement processes, it's, it's the quarter where planning, our um, partnership arrangements is being set up. So we normally do not expect a, expect a high spending within this quarter. So at the end of quarter one, the department managed to achieve 11.7%. Um, and the target rate for the department was at 55% of the target set for quarter one. The two programs that was not able to meet the targets is economic planning and then the tourism arts and entertainment area. With regard to economic planning, this specifically relates to number one, evidence that needed to be provided for one of our, our indicators. I think it's very important for us as a department to ensure that we are able to substantiate performance through evidence documentation 
And if those documentation does not substantiate performance, it is then not accepted as a, an, an area of um, where we will report it as a target achieved. Then the second issue is a timing issue between our entity's quarterly performance report and the department's quarterly report. So not technically an underachievement, just a timing issue. The third issue relates to staff shortages. So this project will be delayed from quarter one. Hopefully we would be making some significant progress, progress towards achieving it in quarter two or quarter three. But this is mainly because staff was reassigned to other GFJ priorities, more specifically the energy area. With regard to tourism, arts and entertainment, within this area, the indicator here is, is what we call a demand-led um, indicator. So it's very difficult to, to always pre project or predict what will happen in terms of this area. Um, for the first quarter, we were in a tourism season that is considered to be more of a low tourism season. So we've slightly was off in terms of our worst, worst likely off in terms of our targets for our tourist guide um, registration. However, the program, I think as we move um, into the year, we'll probably more than likely make up this target. Uh, with regard to the tourism safety services, this just relates to a shortage in materials that we needed to procure. However, the procurement will be concluded in quarter two. And again, it would be easy for the programming to make up that, that target was in the latter quarters. Just again, some of the notable achievements that we would like to highlight. I think our quarter 23-24 started off with a, with a bang. Um, the, probably our biggest achievement was the launch of our new strategy, which is the Growth for Jobs strategy. Then also we've landed our um, JSE partnership, and this will be a partnership that will provide significant um, support to our SMMEs specifically. Um, and not only financial support, but it will also provide S, um, supply chain opportunities to, to SMMEs um, within this area. Then our funds, uh, our export booster, SMME booster, as well as our tour tourism challenge fund has also been launched. Um, these are all very exciting funds for us because not only will we be providing financial support to the beneficiaries of these funds, but at the same time, it's also unlocking great partnership opportunities to beneficiaries and helping us to actually build our ecosystem within each of these areas. Then with regard to, our, again, our ease of doing business, the, we've We've actually managed to formalize two regulatory reforms. With regard to our skills area, we've actually managed to train 490 persons, and it's all within key areas, so software, business skills. We are moving well, uh, moving into the clothing sector, so machinists, and then again, our, our call center agents. Um, We've had 62 consumer workshops and, as previously mentioned, 207 guides that was, was registered. Um, Chi, I think that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation. Members, we will now have an opportunity for you to ask questions. So again, if you could please use the raise hand function to indicate if you have questions. We'll take questions in rounds of three, um, and if you could please keep your questions between two and three questions at a time. Thank you. I recognize member in Kondlo. No, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, Maybe the first thing just to understand in terms of how it is presented, um, the, the, the targets versus what is spent, um, if you can clarify that to me much more simpler. Um, and I think my concern would also be uh, when I looked at what has been spent, Particularly, I think it's two programs which includes economic planning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I understand where 
uh, the percentage is higher uh, of what has been spent versus the target. Uh, so if you can just explain to me, because if you have not achieved, what is the spending that would then have gone up uh, if I'm reading uh, that beyond just the arithmetic explanation? So if you can just get me an understanding um, uh, of this. And then um, I'm interested to know also if the job numbers I see in the West, in the one of the, the slides, actually with Westgro, there is a number uh, on the investments there of what potentially are jobs, which uh, are about 2.7, if I'm not mistaken, is that is the department doing the same predictions on the other two? Because obviously there is a lot of um, work that is done or investment or even funds that have been secured. Do those translate into any number of jobs? And will these be jobs that in the following quarter we can be able to follow and see them in the next um, 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 uh, quarterly uh, labor force uh, results. So if I can just uh, uh, get a, a, a clarity about that. My third and the last question for this round, Chair, is on the red tape uh, reporting. And I'm happy that there is mention there of the work support that you are doing in the with the municipalities. But I think a question that one has always been asking is that this red tape reporting on the number of queries, what has been resolved. Up until this point, are we unable, is the department unable to provide us the numbers or the percentage of those that queries or those interventions that has been done for the informal sector of the economy? So I would like to understand that at this point. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Member Nkontlo. Um, I see no other hands from members. Um, Member Nkontlo, your hand is still up. I don't know if you if you had something else you wanted to add. Nope. Okay. Uh, Member Brinkes, I recognize you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, Chair, yes, uh, to the department. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, Chair, I just got a uh, very simple question. Um, in terms of uh, Mitchell Splint, can the department uh, uh, bring me up to date with uh, the Mitchell Splint area? Has there been any um, uh, program planning uh, and programs uh, planned for Mitchell Splint in the last quarter of uh, 2022 and in this quarter of uh, first quarter of 2023? Uh, in terms of economic um, opportunity planning, is there any uh, uh, plans, uh, Chair, uh, for the Mitchell's Plain area? This is a very broad question, but if the department, the, the department can just give me an indication in terms of planning for Mitchell's Plain area. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Member. Um, I would, uh, Member, your hand is still up. I'm not sure if you wanted to come in again. Okay, I'm going to treat that as a legacy hand. Um, I also have a few questions I'd like to put forward from my side. So my first question um, with regards to the Sassel Freeport um, Soldana Green Hydrogen deal, um, what is the timeline for Westgrow um, in terms of bringing this investment into fruition? And also um, from which countries do we anticipate to get the most foreign investment from with regards to this program? Then um, my next question is, uh, I think slide seven says there's 54, I'm assuming towns, um, received infrastructure support via uh, trading space upgrades and new trading premises, premises that were um, geographically sped, spread across five municipalities. Um, if we could also get a sense of how many jobs were created here. And then lastly, I think it's slide eight, it says 9,697 9, persons were trained. Um, my question is, of these, how many then went into permanent employment? I'll now hand back to the department.
Uh, you're on mute, HOD. Sorry, HOD. Sure. So, I think we lost you. Oh, I thought you wanted to go first. Minister. No, no, I just, I just wanted to just say that you were on mute at the time. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I'm happy to take some of the questions or, or could I just hand over to you uh, with the various uh, questions? Some would go to the CFO, uh, some would be on the uh, reporting from the entities. And then there's a question to the red tape reduction unit. Um, then there's, I think might be um, helpful if we just clarify with the green hydrogen uh, you know what uh, West Coast role is there? Because um, um, you know that is not related to the Sasol MOU per se, but in the ecosystem itself. Um, HD, did you want to take a first uh, stab at it? Yeah, let me let me take a first stab at the Sasol uh, Memorandum of Understanding. So, as far as the Sasol uh, Memorandum of, of Understanding as it relates to Freeport Saldana. It places Saldana SEZ in a good position to provide the land from which the electrolysis can be built. It is really a commitment that we are giving to the two entities that are forming a business partnership, one being Sasol and the other being Asolometal. Um, and Asolometal then purchasing uh, the uh, molecules that would have been produced if the electrolysis is placed within the Saldana SEZ to fire up the steel plant in Saldana so that Asolometal can produce a, a what's called green hydrogen. So here it is really a place, piece of land that we are committing in the MOE to provide to the two entities that have signed an agreement for the production of hydrogen within the SEZ space. Minister? Thank you very much, uh, HOD. Um, then, um, uh, maybe we'll just work backwards then. Then there was a question from Honorable Brinkhase. So the uh, economic planning um, program isn't a, a kind of town planning project, um, but uh, you asked specifically about any interventions uh, in Mitchell's plane per se. Um, and here I'll draw on the department. I mean, we can definitely talk about the thousand opportunities program within the skills development. Uh, in which we have a large number of participants from the Mitchell's Plain area um, who are joined for those interviews and matching with the BPO sector. Uh, and there might be other examples as well. Um, I wonder if uh, the department can um, help me out on that one. We'll ask uh, Nizam uh, Minister to take that question on Rashid. Yeah, Minister, so two things. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you for the question. The first is that um, the first question is how many of them find employment? Well, uh, um, more than 80% of the beneficiaries that complete our program um, ends up in full-time um, employment. With respect to source markets, uh, we can provide the, the, the numbers for you, but Mitchell's Plain uh, represents one of our largest source markets um, for employment uh, in the Mitchell's Plain uh, sector. With respect to the Day of a Thousand Opportunities, Minister, um, we have decided to move um, uh, for the interviews. We moved it closer to the townships. Um, our first uh, three um, Days of a Thousand Opportunities was in Athlone, and the reason for that is regarded as a transport node. And in future, we plan on moving those jobs, those interviews, closer to the area, so into Mitchell's Plain, into Kailicha, and into Langa, so that these individuals don't have to pay the extra funds uh, to come through for the interviews. On these days, we typically um, receive anything from three, from two to 4,000 uh, beneficiaries, of which our rate is typically one to three hiring uh, on the day. Thank you, Minister. I hope that answered your questions. Thank you. Uh, DDG Tofi, would you like to add on anything? Yes, I just wanted to add, Minister, in relation to other work we do in the Mitchell's Plain area, I can 
either I can add or John, I'll, I'll just mention the fact that one of our very successful booster fund projects is we work with our labs, which is a Mitchell's plan based um, intermediary. And through that, we've managed to create some amazing opportunities there. Um, John, would you like to add some of the details of what we do at our labs in Mitchell's plan? Okay, Minister, thank you. can uh, I do that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, to give some real good details, I'm going to ask maybe Joshua was the project manager on that one. Joshua, the R Labs one, specifically in Westridge. Okay, thanks, uh, John. Um, so, in terms of the booster fund, so there's definitely uh, work in Mitchell's plane in terms of the business that are being supported. Um, the type of support that we're doing is around mentorship, um, training. Uh, looking at getting uh, different types of master classes um, that we helping the businesses to basically assist them and support them in terms of their development and their growth um, in terms of the support that we do provide. Our labs also as an organization through the process also would facilitate them to access to economic opportunities. Um, so that I think broadly is the kind of support that we do provide via the, the booster fund. So it's not just one particular type of support, but it's a range of initiatives that is supported via the booster fund. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you. Then, um, then we had questions from Honourable Kondlo. The first was around the red tape reduction unit reporting and um, work on the informal economy. Um, and then uh, there were questions on the uh, jobs numbers reported by the entities. Uh, I'm not sure who, who would take that question. And then um, perhaps CFO, you could respond on the question on the spend versus targets. Mr. Peters, let's start with you. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll respond to the to the to the red tape one. Yes, the 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 business helpline. We we help any type of business that calls in. However, we do not have a specific category with regard to informal businesses because when we are addressing queries, we do it based on 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 specific categories such as access to finance, access to business support or block permit or something like that. So we don't specifically categorize and ask the business, are you formal or informal? Uh, but we will certainly consider that to to if we if we improve on the system and if that's going to give us additional information on which to act. Um, then on the other issue on the on the trading hubs, uh, I mean as, as we reflected there, it's five municipalities. Um, of that in that 54 we created uh, or, or the or the or the hub. In, in, in support of those businesses created uh, 60 jobs of those 54 uh, businesses. Thank you. Minister, Minister should I go ahead and just answer the question on the entities? Um, yeah, thank you. I'll, Member Nkondlo, thank you for that. I think one of the things I wanted to mention is that the, the the spectacular results we had on the last quarterly jobs survey, the the fact that you know the unemployment rate came down by six percent, just shows that it's it's the work we do in the entire ecosystem to make this a, a viable place to invest that really makes an impact. So sometimes our our direct job numbers coming out of let's say interventions by Westgro or, or ASEZ, they play a certain role, the direct jobs, but it really is the it's the overall job numbers that come from the business confidence in the region that are that give you those kind of kind of amazing results. So I'm going to go to Ilsa. Ilsa, would you just touch on 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 the Westgro opportunities? And I think you you may have some answers, or if you could comment on on the um, the other two entities. And if not, perhaps Herman could come in there on Sultana IDZ. Sure. Thanks, Rashid. Um, so in terms of that, Member Nkundlu, the, the Westgrove jobs are basically made up of the trade agreements that are signed in relation to exports. So that's monitored. We monitor that every single quarter. Um, they also have targets. It's, it's very much reported on in terms of their APP. We just verify the, the evidence around that. Um, but it is really very much doing well compared to last year in terms of the different targets. So you can see that the, the economy is responding well. And in investment, similarly, so there it's already they respond that in terms of investments landed, both foreign direct investment as well as direct domestic investment. Again, that's monitored quarterly by us. We do the oversight. Uh, we go certain targets in terms of their APP. And again, in this past quarter, um, in this financial year, they have really been performing well and have really exceeded them. So 
Um, that's where the, the West Grove figures come in. I don't know if Hadman and Fern will just want to respond in terms of Atlantis and Saldana Bay. Thank you. Thank you, CFO. She, with I'm regard to... Go ahead. Go ahead, CFO. With regard to the question from Member Nkondlo around the targets versus the percentage spent, so Member's right, it, it looks like it's not it's not um, related, but the targets refers to the fourth quarter. So, for example, within the fourth quarter, if we look at business regulation and governance, there was three targets of which two was, was achieved. So two out of three would give us the 67%. With regard to economic planning, the targets was eight and seven was achieved. So same principle would then give us the 88%. With regard to the percentage spend, because it's at the end of quarter four, it would be a cumulative amount. So you're looking at cumulative um, spending as at the end of quarter four. So the 98.1%, although only one target wasn't achieved for the, the quarter, it would have been a, the, a small project, which was basically the probity checks, um, which if I can recall would have probably been like 150 or maybe 200,000 that uh, would not have been spent. Was in economic planning, similar principles, one of our largest budgets, so the 96.6%, would then reflect the one project, which is the seed stage business skills project that was not achieved. But the quarter four achievement of targets relates to quarter four. So um, six out of seven out of eight in economic planning and two out, two out of three in terms of business regulation and governance, which would then give you your percentage that you're seeing um, reflected in that targets. Thank you. Minister, I'm not sure if uh, Bernal or Herman wanted to comment on the jobs as it, as it relates to uh, SEZ and uh, and Saldana uh, from Herman, because um, they do report on those numbers, but I'd like uh, to hear uh, the, the, the two comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, HOD. Herman, shall I go first? Thank you, HOD, for the last quarter of the financial year 22-23. No new jobs were created, but in the first quarter with the construction phase um, starting for the Atlantis SEZ, 43 jobs were created, um, a significant number of whom um, the employed people were directly from the Atlantis community. Um, jobs attract um, by way of, of forms that the um, that the investor or the service provider in the case of the construction phase um, provides the SEZ with. Um, I hope that that's enough. Chairman. Thank you, HOD. Uh, thank you, Chair, if I may. Um, the jobs numbers for the Freeport Saldana um, are measured via uh, a pre-agreed model. So at the beginning of the five year, uh, the job counts were in their strategic plan for the five-year period um, with a five-year target and then annual measurements. Um, the model was also agreed upon. Uh, it's a model that is, takes into account uh, capital expenditure as well as operational expenditure and then uses a social accounting matrix to calculate the jobs. Um, and they measure jobs that are direct plus uh, induced. And that modeling is also independently done and not done by Freeport Saldana itself. And for the previous financial year, the total number came to 944 jobs. They do report on that in the uh, strategic plan as the as their um, their outcome targets for for each year of the five year period. I'm sorry, maybe also to add, the modelling is actually done a lot more regularly than just the annual uh, the annual uh, targets. The, the, the modeling actually is done monthly to make sure they track that as the investors and the Freeport Saldana itself spend money, that the that the effects are felt in the local economy. They also do a gross geographic product, a, a GGP for the Western Cape uh, tracking in the same model. Thank you. Okay, just to check, we've covered all your questions. 
I'm going to put that. Sorry. Minister, I think there's still a question on a uh, on Saldana Freeport on green hydrogen. Where do we expect uh, the molecules to go to? Which countries would be receiving those molecules? Um, and of course, uh, who are the foreign investors that are interested in uh, Saldana SCZ? Maybe Herman should not have left the stage. Uh, we can defer that question to you, Minister, if you allow. Thank you, HOD. Thank you, Chair. Um, the investor pipeline for green hydrogen is quite mixed, um, so there's no there's no specific country. In fact, it's in a healthy mix between local investors and foreign investors. Now, um, Sasol, of course, is a multinational company, um, but it's the Sasol, it's a South African entity that's looking at the big investment in green hydrogen in Saldana. Some of the other big projects are from the UK and from Europe. Um, and there are also some other big local developers. One of the projects is called Atlantia. They're looking for foreign funding, but with local, mostly local shareholding. And what I might add, um, uh, Chair, is that a lot of the concessional funding, uh, grant funding for feasibility studies and for projects um, are coming from the EU. So the EU is making a strong case for their involvement in the South African and specifically the Sultana green hydrogen picture. Um, and it seems to be that across the globe, the Japanese have captured the market in Australia, obviously because of proximity and also around the back of the world, the, the trade route over over the, um, over the Pacific Ocean towards Chile. So Chile is another high production potential um, location. Um, and that made for the geopolitical shift that Europe is focusing on, on obviously North Africa, because there's some, there's some proximity there also, but then Southern Africa as a diversification. Um, so yes, the, 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 the investors are not specifically uh, from a specific region, but a lot of the funding is coming from Europe. Thank you. Thank you, HRD. Um, are you covered on your side? Okay. Members, are there any follow up questions or any new questions that you might have? I recognize Member and Gondel. Chaperson, thank you for the, for the responses. And um, I would really, I think one has been lamenting these issues uh, of the informal sector in this in this committee for some time now. And I think it it is only fair. I think it can't be like, you know, we are not reporting on the red tape. Um, uh, we don't get that data. For me, I think that data is important. If indeed, when we ask the question, about the prioritization of the informal sector, we will be told that such is being attended to. Because we know informality, and I think there was even a presentation done by the same department about the issues and challenges of the informal sector. So if there is not gonna be a focus to measure, track, and see in the big interventions that we're doing to try and unlock you know, some of the burden particularly of those that would be in the periphery of the of the economy. Surely, you know, we will be reporting about, yes, this number of business plans. Um, as the province, we are um, um, uh, moving even ahead of other provinces. But we're not going to be able to say the one person or one entrepreneur who is mostly affected, are we able to ensure that they are tapping into this uh, very grand intervention? So I am pleading, Minister and the HOD, that indeed the issue of the data as it relates to informality, it's important for us to track because science or evidence, even of our own mirrors, Minister was here presenting to us um, uh, the, 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 the report in the, in the last um, uh, mirror that demonstrate the informal sector and how that has registered positive growth. And I don't think we can afford to just ignore on our instruments and intervention. So I am pleading with this that in the next quarter, one would be expecting if it still can't be done, it's better when it is said, no, no, we've got limitations of doing it. But it can't be a question that is asked every time and it's not being responded to. The second comment, Chair, I want to make is that 
and perhaps colleagues can be able to explain to me. When you look in the skills development, perhaps it's only those that um, have been achieved or not, and I'm open to listen to the response. I see in the uh, skills uh, uh, opportunities or skills programs that uh, are, are reported on, one can actually see that uh, the smallest um, um, uh, industries that um, uh, actually are reported on in this quarter, you know, is your digital with almost 78 um, uh, uh, skills opportunities, I'm assuming if I'm using the right language, and the 33 in tourism. And the biggest is call center, and uh, general, which is retail and others. I'm worried that one is not seeing much more um, on the green economy, on the infrastructure related outside of the 355 artisan related um, uh, training uh, opportunities that are there. Because for me, surely, if we are talking about a G4J, which I would assume that it, it is this particular quarter or the last quarter of last year where the strategy was being de developed, that we need to ensure that across the primary um, uh, economic sectors of this province, that we are ensuring that participation of young people um, and, and, and many into the priority uh, uh, skills uh, sectors and the priority to that they are able to um, uh, get uh, uh, economic opportunities. If I'm incorrect, please uh, advise me, colleagues, but this particular report from where I'm sitting, you know, in terms of uh, the economic industries, it doesn't demonstrate that there is a, a more um, a deliberate uh, a attention to ensure that the sectors that we prioritize that actually even uh, reflect um, uh, the type of um, uh, programs we have in the department in terms just of the skills are actually finding expression in terms of the work that we are, uh, that we are doing. It might be an issue of this particular quarter. I do not know. I'll be, I'll be happy if I'm, 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 I'm made to understand. One question that I have, can, can one be told what are these uh, specific bylaws uh, that um, um, through the, I think it's light uh, 10, it says we developed uh, three model policies and two model bylaws. What are, the, what are those uh, bylaws, if you can just be specific? And then there are proposed reforms in the five municipal policies. And um, if uh, one can just get what in, in essence are those bylaws uh, about? Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much. I see no further hands, um, just the legacy hand from Member and Contlo. So with that, um, I would also just like to put my final questions forward. Um, so my final questions, um, just going back to green hydrogen, I asked about timelines um, in terms of the investment coming into fruition, um, but also I'm interested in timelines associated um, with with everything actually coming online and us being able to transport and deliver the green hydrogen produced. Um, then on, on slide nine, I think it is, there was a 540 million rand saving um, for the economy for 22-23. Um, if the different components of that, which make up the figure could just be broken down for me so I can understand what the calculation is based on. Um, and then, um, you caught my interest at uh, liquor licenses um, and creating online applications there. And I understand that this is quite a complex area because, um, and, and I'm not sure if this has been addressed, so it would be helpful if you could explain to me how the online application may address or make these processes a bit easier or if they haven't yet been resolved. Um, the one issue I understand is that when an applicant puts their application forward, if there's an error um, in their application, they have to redo that application in entirety and it comes with cost. Um, and so whether that has maybe been addressed and that also um, there are extremely high costs um, for a lot of the applicants and many of them have to depend on external consultants because there's a lot of um, administration involved. Um, and they use this process as well to expedite their application, which can be quite unfair. Um, and also the issue of um, their licenses lapsing um, and any kind of 
leeway that they could be given in that regard. So um, what I understand of that issue is that previously, um, if a liquor license holder's application had lapsed, they had applied before, but it hadn't been renewed timeously, then they would be without a license and couldn't trade. So those are some of the issues related to liquor licenses, and I was wondering if the online application attempted to deal with any of those. Um, but then also, just lastly, the SMME Booster Fund, you spoke about partners. Um, if you could just elaborate on who some of those partners are. And with that, I'll hand back to the department. Thank you. Okay. I'm not sure if Minister is still here, but I think maybe if we could start with uh, Madam Gondlo's questions. Um, John, I'm not sure if you want to make a comment around you know, how we can slice and dice the data to be able to reflect on the question that uh, Member Gondlo asked. And then the other question Member Gondlo asked relates to the skills, um, whether we are working beyond what we are reflecting here in quarter one. Uh, for example, are we doing anything around the skills of the future, more particularly around the green, green economy? Uh, and then maybe Rashid and Faye, if you could talk to the bylaws um, that are proposed, what's there, what are they? Um, and then we'll then afterward pivot to the chair's uh, questions. Maybe if you could start with those, uh, John and then Rashid okay. and then Faye. Thank you very much, Vijay uh, um, Chen. Yeah, just really, I'll just respond to the to the the informal uh, question. Uh, look, I think point taken. We will uh, slice and dice, and also where necessary, uh, relevant, we'll then capture the informal category, uh, specifically then on the on the business outline. So that will give us that will definitely then be able to show how many calls we're getting from the business outline. Also, just remember that a lot of our permit related issues and issues where law enforcement with a complaints against law enforcement in many cases comes through the through the business chambers. So it comes from the informal sector business chamber, it comes through the Black Business Council, and it also comes sometimes through um, the state chamber. So those so the, those chambers of commerce and even NAFCO, right? So we deal with it in that way. But uh, we will then add a category in the in the business outline that relates to informal informal businesses. The other thing also we think we must note that quite a few of our projects we we do include there is informal but they are informal businesses such as the one in, in, in Mitchell's plan, especially the startup businesses where they normally where these businesses normally start up as informal. The the businesses that we that we're helping uh, with the Department of Labor and that's all across the sorry Department of Agriculture. It's all across the province. Uh, that's all informal. And what we will do is we will then capture those businesses in terms of formal and informal. So point taken on that one. Um, the bylaws. I'm going to ask uh, Michelle. She's got detail in which, in terms of which the uh, which municipalities we worked in, and also the specific bylaws, and then also the general breakdown of the savings of 540 million rand. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> so, in terms of the bylaws, the model bylaws that were developed, um, there was one for the full form permitting then a bylaw relating to events permitting, and then one um, a policy relating to the SMME development forms to municipal one, early childhood policy. <clears throat> so through our intervention, the city has now re-looked at the, the policies because we highlighted obviously the various municipal compliance, compliance barriers for ECDs to become registered. We also sub submitted a number of commentary on the draft mobile business policy that was last year. And in this first quarter of this financial year, we then um, commented on the, the amended informal trading by law, which incorporates um, the mobile, which incorporates um, and makes provision for mobile businesses. <clears throat> and in Stellenbosch, we um, worked on the development of economic overlay zone to be incorporated in the municipal planning bylaws. And I mentioned the form and event permitting already regarding the policies. Um, John, you asked a breakdown of the 540 million. Um, again, that, that was only assessing three interventions, which was one phase one of the Western Public Authority that was managed by Tim. 
And then we looked at the amendments um, with Department of Environmental Affairs and Development Planning in terms of the, um, the Land Use Planning Amendment. Act and then also one big intervention in terms of the business support helpline, and that's how we came to the 540 million rand figure. Thank you. Uh, may I handle the uh, liquor license, the Western Cape Liquor Authority question? Um, the Western Cape Liquor Authority uh, already had in place a, a sophisticated uh, back office system for the processing of their um, of all the paperwork, and it literally was paperwork before they they digitised the system. Um, we were involved with them uh, in the previous financial year, 21-22, and we, as DDAT, funded uh, through a transfer payment eight uh, three out of eight modules. And then what happened in this last financial year, 22-23, is that we funded the balance of the modules. Um, and essentially, this took all of the forms, the, the paper forms, and converted them into a, a digital version thereof, and a, a whole process flow related to that. Um, as regards to errors, um, the advantage of a digital solution is it can generally trap errors at source. Um, the system introduced all sorts of different ways for people to pay their different fees um, and has streamlined their operations. Um, we didn't, we're not actually, we, we weren't ourselves concerned with the actual, uh, the forms themselves as to what they were asking because those are all um, legislation, legislated and the WCLA deals with that. Um, overall, they were aiming for a 25% reduction in processing time. Um, and uh, want to achieve that in the first few years, and the results have been encouraging so far. I trust that's sufficient. Thank you. And there was a question relating to the lapses of licenses. Is uh, um, I, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know. We, we, you know, we don't know the exact processes. We just assisted largely with funding and the project management. And then the question on uh, SMME Booster Fund, uh, John or Josh. So thanks, uh, HD. So the different partners uh, for the SMME Booster Fund uh, for the period was organizations such as R Labs, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, Edge Growth, the Bicycle Empowerment Network, uh, Warm Up, the SA Agri Academy, Productivity South Africa, and then ASISA. So those were the partners that we engaged with in the SMME Booster Fund. Thank you. Chair, the, the question that we, we haven't answered for you was the question on the license lapses, and we may need to find out how we find out who the responsible uh, uh, support for that is, and then maybe uh, circle back to the chair, unless there's someone who knows where we go with that. Uh, Rashid? Rashid, you're on mute. Sorry. Not not on the liquor license, HOD, but on the question the chairperson asked about green hydrogen timelines. I just wanted Herman to give a, a realistic sense of when that's happening. I know in our in our meeting with DTIC yesterday, it's it's it is pretty clear that we, we won't see any real deal flows or deals being closed on green hydrogen until 2025, more or less. But Herman, would you like to give some sense of the timelines for investments, but then also for when we actually start having an offtake of it? Thank you, Rashid. Um, Chairperson, there's 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 timelines are staggered quite a bit, and the size of the projects I think often um, determine those timelines. There are two uh, categories of local consumption projects um, that have shorter timelines and a smaller scale, and there are two components of export projects that have larger scale and and longer timelines. I think on the short scale small projects, there are three pilot. Uh, projects that are already producing green hydrogen, and one of them is already selling it into the local market, but that's for chemical use, and it's and it's relatively small. It's around five tons per day. Um, but one of the companies that's got a local uh, um, pilot plant want, are looking to get financial close on their project in the next financial year. Um, so that's sort of the earliest, and that's relatively small scale. It's a mobility application for trucks running on green hydrogen. Um, at, in, in the middle of the scale, more or less, there's uh, ArcelorMittal who want to do green steel uh, because of green hydrogen used in their steel plant. And that's sort of a 500,000 ton per year, uh, sorry, 100,000 ton per year order of magnitude project. Their financial close target date is um, is 2025, so they're doing pre-feasibility and feasibility work until then. Financial close aim is 2025, and steel production aim is 2027. 
And then at the top end of the scale, the major export projects that include either bunker fuels onto ships or direct export. Um, those are in the 500 to a million tons per year size projects. Um, and those timelines are not very clear. They, there are two or three projects that are also in pre-feasibility study phase, but whether they get through it very quickly and start to sign uh, off takes and get financial close very quickly, or whether they go through a lot of a lot more technical uh, detailed studies that's hard to determine. What I can say on the bunker fields one, which is a really large scale uh, potential export project, is that we've got funding from the World Bank. They've concluded the feasibility, sorry, the pre-feasibility study, and they hope to announce that in October at the Presidential Green Hydrogen Summit. And we've also heard today that they've got another four and a half million rand from the Global Infrastructure Fund to take that project into a full feasibility stage. And then even the possibility when, once that is concluded for funding to take that whole project to the market. So that'll be transaction advisory support, et cetera. And that will be in the tens of millions. So a lot of money already being spent, a lot of companies already committing resources, um, but the investment decisions are maybe a year, two year, or a little bit longer off uh, for the big bulk projects. I hope that gives a, a decent picture. Thank you. HD, should I cover the one on skills? Yes, that is the one not standing on my list. Yes, Nizam. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Melissa, uh, member, thank you for the, the question. Um, so. The first is uh, the BPO work, Minister. Virtually none of the um, candidates that we support on the offshore side does inbound, outbound sales, right? So we don't do sales. Um, in fact, the word BPO is maybe misnomer. Globally, it's now re it's referred to as global business services. This is very complex back office work that includes IT, finance, um, and very, very other um, and, and hospitality, so working for the airlines. Um, for example, I just want to sort of give you a sense the type of um, BPO or global business services work that we do here. Um, within the tech space, uh, we will service the telecom facsimile um, in Australia. So one of Australia's biggest uh, network providers, and people will call in, I've got a problem with my modem, there's a speed issue, and this is including big companies. Um, um, we, in terms of the hospital, so uh, in terms of the, um, sorry, in terms of the IT jobs, um, when we did the count last year, it was over 600 IT related jobs, uh, tech jobs that we um, facilitated in the BPO sector. Again, very highly complex work. We also deal with finance. Um, um, so we work, lots of the work is done for big banks. Um, and it's again very complex works that very often require some some sense of advanced understanding um, of finance, which the companies um, typically provide. With respect to our hospitality sector, which is also a big driver, obviously, um, this year we awarded about 300 jobs in the hospitality sector, uh, which includes 42 learners at AXA, Bosch, and Darwin, some high end. Um, um, high-end jobs, uh, high-end hospitality uh, companies. With respect to the green economy, and then with digital, we also support companies like Web Africa, MindWorks on software, uh, software development, and, and high-end work. With respect to clothing manufacturing, we awarded 589 um, uh, work opportunities um, in the clothing and textile space, and that's very really interesting because basically nearly 100% of all the beneficiaries that go through our clothing and textiles are, are made permanent. I want to give you one success story. In Caledon, um, we supported um, Truworths in that particular area. They've exhausted all the available potential labor uh, at that one site. They have 800 people employed there. They're now busing in people a half an hour away, all the way from Hermanus, because they don't have any more skills. And that's all absorbed. It's the single largest uh, employer um, in Caledon. And in that space, we support people like Cape Union Mart, K-Way, Truworth, Fushini, Pim. And the idea there is to move some of those jobs back from India, Bangladesh, and the subcontinent <clears throat> so that uh, we address those, those imports. Um, with respect to artisans, and again, it's very expensive. It costs about 230,000 and only for the skills component on artisans. Um, this year so far, uh, we support 200 artisans. Those are blue collar workers and you see the risk 
to organizations such as, such, such as ESCOM and even the ports because we don't have enough artisans. We're supporting 200 there. And then lastly, on the green economy, um, we are demand led. We will never ever train if there's no a contractual guarantee of at least 80% employment. And if there's no 80% employment, we have the right to claw that money back um, from, from the lead company or the host company. In the green space, we develop new curricula that best suits the industry, and industry has assist us, assist us in designing those new curricula. Once the demand is coming, or we know that the demand, the, the runway for demand is much shorter, we will then support um, the green economy with more gusto than what we have. We have, however, piloted these green economies, so this, um, solar PV. Um, I'm not sure what the number is, but there's a few dozen or so individuals that we put on there, and that's already Eddie, those individuals are already now in the economy. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you uh, for the question and thank you, HOD. Um, Ms. I'll maybe just also mention the solar installers program uh, and the partnership with the TVET colleges. Uh, yeah, thank you about that, for that, Minister. Yes, there we've got support of, uh, uh, of the Germans who assist us in developing this dual vocational model. Um, so it's not you spend all the time in the classroom. Um, it's a staccato-like arrangement, some time in the classroom, then the, the firm in the classroom in the firms. Um, and that was that solar PV that I was referring to. We piloted that program, Minister, I think I'm pretty sure with over 100 or so beneficiaries, I can confirm. But we have, uh, we've, we, we assisted with private sector, uh, some of the German companies, and our TBIT colleges in the design of a new solar PV. One of the key constraints to that sector is that we don't have enough people, A, to install, and then the burden to maintain and manage and maintain that is quite high. Um, so we've looked down the line, see what the potential demand is, see what, um, what IPPs are in the pipeline, both at the city and national, and try to um, um, uh, preempt uh, the demand that will come of that, looked at from an educational perspective, what's the gaps um, uh, across a number of these uh, um, uh, occupations, and now we have to be developing those. We're also doing the same with electricity, um, um, maintenance of, of electricity plants and water plants out in the municipalities. We recognize the risk there. We are busy with EWCTA, so that's the energy and water CETA. And again, looking at what qualifications we need to design in support of that. And then obviously when there is demand, we will then fund uh, both if there's any top up skills that's required and typically funds for that. We get that from um, private sector um, companies that's not even housed, uh, domiciled in the Western Cape. They will fund the skills component and we will fund the stipend component. Thank you for that, Minister. That's the whole list from my book, uh, Chair. Excellent, thank you. Members, are there any further questions before we excuse the department? Okay, I see none. With that, I would like to sincerely thank the Minister, both HODs and all the officials who've joined us today, as well as anyone who might be listening to us. Minister, I'm not sure if there are any closing remarks from your side and also from HOD. Uh, just to say thank you very much to the committee for this engagement and for the questions. And we look forward to seeing you in the next quarter. Thank you. Thank you very much. HOD, anything from your side? Okay. HOD is off. All right, um, we look forward to seeing you in the next quarter as well. Um, you may be excused, um, and we really do appreciate the time and the effort that you've put into this and into feeding back to us today so that we can um, meaningfully conduct oversight. Um, we'll allow the officials, um, Minister and HOD, to excuse themselves. Oh, I see um, Mr. Tofi. All right, we'll allow them to excuse themselves and then we will do our resolutions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee.
All right, Mendes. Um, I think some individuals are still um, leaving, but I think we can proceed with resolutions. Uh, please, can you raise your hand to indicate if there are any resolutions that you have from your side coming up from today's engagement? I firstly recognize Member Brinkes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. Chair, yes, in terms of resolutions, I would uh, suggest that uh, um, as the department has indicated uh, uh, in Mitchell's plane, uh, they work very uh, uh, intensively with, uh, with, with our labs. So in terms of resolutions, I would uh, suggest that um, uh, we can maybe uh, possibly early as uh, this year have an oversight uh, at uh, our labs in Mitchell's plane so that we maybe can proceed for ourselves. Uh, how they are doing and see, you know, how we can also as a committee uh, support them and, you know, and show that, uh, you know, that we are interested in them. So, um, yes, uh, uh, I think uh, if the, before the end of year, end of this uh, year, uh, financial year, if we can just uh, maybe have an oversight at our labs in suspend. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Member. I recognize Member Nkondlo. Thank you, Chair. Mine, Chair, I think uh, I would appreciate if we could, um, looking at the calendar, of course, uh, maybe at some point uh, request them to come and present this modeling that they were referring to uh, around uh, the issue of jobs, uh, particularly in the entities, because I think as it was being explained uh, for me, it was really interesting how, because as the colleague was saying, they do it even monthly, you know, to anticipate and record jobs. I think it would be interesting for them to sort of share with us so that we can understand how they do that. Secondly, is just to um, uh, communicate with the department uh, on the data regarding red tape on informal se uh, informal sector for the next uh, uh, quarter reporting. I think that would be important as I think the colleague uh, said it is possible. And maybe just for me to request some, some more information on the bylaws, uh, because they had to summarize, of course, because there is no time, just to get understanding of the bylaws that they were mentioning, just a summary of, of each. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you. Um, I wonder if we can even tie in that presentation with the next time they deliver the next quarterly, because we were, we were lagging behind on this quarterly, and I don't think it Myself and Zira are still looking at a couple of dates because it is a bit tricky right now, but we can perhaps pair the two together um, because then it will also give us a, a better insight into the next quarterly. Um, but cool. Um, member Van de Vestesen. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, uh, I did register already my discomfort with the uh, lack of information in the presentation dealt with us. To say that you have uh, achieved 90% of your targets, one target was uh, partially achieved, and that is the one in paragraph 1, 2, 5, 2, whatever the case might be, bursaries, says very little. Is it a matter that you promised or you intended to award a 1,000 bursaries and you only uh, awarded 980, or is that you uh, intended to award 1,000 bursaries and you've only awarded 10? Both of these are partially achieved. Uh, really, uh, partially achieved uh, can be as wide, you know, as the uh, as, 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 as the ocean. So I, I, I really believe that we should expect of the department when it comes and it, it represents again, on its uh, performance, that it uh, really provides us with the necessary information in the presentation, not in supporting documentation that they will not be uh, presenting. As uh, Honorable Nkondlu quite rightly said, you know, if people look at this in years to come on YouTube uh, or, or they just attend this meeting, I think uh, the members of the public have the right also to be as well informed within the available time as, as, as possible. And therefore, my proposal is that we uh, 
uh, insist that when the uh, de department comes and they again uh, report to us in terms of their uh, performance, that they really provide us in the presentation with uh, with more information uh, so that we can really appreciate and and ask uh, probing questions regarding the, the 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 presentation that is my that is my uh, recommended resolution okay thank you very much uh, member Brunkes, is that a legacy hand yes sorry for that <laughs> no problem member in control Yes, Chair. Something that uh, we may want to think about. I had found what uh, Provincial Treasury um, uh, did with their presentation quite uh, valuable. I think in uh, particularly in managing and tracking this problem, which he said is government-wide uh, around the COE, but also this issue of grants. Actually, Chair, whilst we do not have the power to actually dictate to other committees, but I think it's something that uh, um, element of cash flow projecting or forecasting, because it helps, I think, for each department to understand what they have in the kitty versus the commitments that they have and where there is a gap from a budgeting point of view. So I think it's just one thing that um, actually, because I was, we were fortunate to be in that presentation with Treasury, I was already anticipating to see it here, particularly in departments like this one and maybe other departments, because I found it as a very critical tool to help ensure that there is this alignment that you can signal early where they, they are, they, they are um, uh, there would be problems. So I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it there, Chair, to say, I think it's a, highly valuable tool, which I would think maybe at some point provincial treasury, maybe from a budgeting point of view, is something that beyond themselves, they may want to think of, um, you know, sharing also or trying to get other departments uh, to, to do it uh, so that they are able to anticipate such uh, for their own uh, 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 planning and, and, and measurement. Thanks, Chair. I wonder what the best way to escalate that is. Um, Perhaps Liz, it can give it um, a little bit of thought as well and, and advise us, um, possibly sending an email or, or via the heater. But I think that's a really, really good, um, a really good shot. And I do think, it, like you suggested, it would be very helpful for them to present it to us um, in layman's terms. But I think, yeah, can do that with the next quarterly. Um, from my side, in terms of resolutions. Um, Member Nkontlo, you raised the the need for data um, on the informal sector and businesses supported there in terms of red tape production. And I wonder if we can even ask them now if they have those numbers or if they can start providing those numbers, because then it at least creates a bit of momentum so that the next time they present, you know, they can actually be prepared or more prepared. And then the other thing was... Um, Mr. Herman Juncker presented a lot of very detailed and interesting information on green hydrogen. And unfortunately, a lot of it went over my head because um, it's all very technical. And I would like to just request that he um, shares the information he provided to the standing committee with us. I thought the World Bank announcement was very interesting um, on the feasibility study. So to get that information in writing would be very helpful. Um, I just want to, uh, Member Van der Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. I think uh, uh, I would love it to be recorded somewhere and perhaps in a resolution that we really appreciate the work of the department, particularly when it comes to uh, economic growth and job creation. Yeah. And if we could, through our support from the department, the support, again, reopen the Saldana Steel factory by uh, assisting Arsenal and Mittal to produce what they call uh, green steel, uh, you know, uh, which will hopefully fetch a premium price on the international steel market, because at the at the current uh, market price for, can I call it dirty steel, 
you know, uh, they were not showing a profit. But the Saldana Steel Factory is a very, very important uh, potential uh, employer on the West Coast. And uh, and I think we need to appreciate in our resolutions the mm -hmm. the potential and and pledge our full support for that initiative. I think it can also then be a catalyst for further expansions in the in the port of Saldana, uh, for other uh, uh, industries to also relocate to to the west coast uh, and and I uh, uh, those of us that have been to Saldana I think we all know the the dire need for an economic stimulator like this so uh, I would love us to 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 just uh, reiterate in our resolutions our appreciation and that we are really looking forward to to this factory potentially reopening agreed Thank you. Um, I just want to check, Ms. Adams, um, are you happy in terms of the resolutions? Were you able to capture everything? Um, yes. Yes, Chairperson, happy. And um, I'll also look back at the recording. OK, thank you. Uh, Member Brinkes? Yes, uh, Chair, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chair, just uh, got to me now that uh, um, the last time we had, uh, last week when we had the oversight there, the citrus farm, um, one of the uh, 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 the guys there, they uh, brought to my attention that um, the Cape Town uh, port is actually uh, not functioning in you know, optimal and, you know, and it's not uh, in terms of functioning and productivity. It's not very mm -hmm. satisfying. And... Um, uh, it's actually very alarming to hear that, you know, when uh, the statistics that they mentioned there that uh, they, they, Cape Town Port can only load uh, nine containers per hour. Where is other ports, you know, also in Africa, they, they, they load something like 250 um, containers per hour. You know, that is, uh, um, that is very concerning. So, uh, you know, uh, I was also wondering if uh, in, uh, proposing that if we can have an oversight at the Cape Town port, you know, and see what for ourselves, what is going on there. I mean, we've heard so much over the last year two or two about the Cape Town port. But yep. uh, if we can go there uh, ourselves as the finance uh, committee, then we can, I mean, uh, just maybe um, uh, get a better understanding of what is going on. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eh? I'm struggling to think when we'll be able to do it, but I want to do it. Um, is a really good suggestion, and I don't know if you if you've had the opportunity to go through the feedback that we received from Transnet in terms of port efficiency. Um, but it was alarming to see how the demand for port services and the the feeder truck services into the port have actually declined, um, and that's also creating a lot of pressure. Um, and more expense um, for our exporters because, of course, the less the the less that they're able to put out on the shipping lines, the more expensive it becomes, and the more competitive it becomes. Um, so, I I want to do it, but let's just try and see how we can figure out the the plan in terms of that. Um, members, any further resolutions? None. Members, thank you so much for your time. I know it's Friday. We've probably all had a very, very long week and I appreciate your inputs as always. Um, thank you for the amazing contributions that you continuously make. And with that meeting adjourned, have a wonderful weekend.